Hello and welcome. I'm Aiden and this is my YouTube channel. And today I have a little bit of a fun project that I want to show you that I've been working on called Simple Agent. Now, Simple Agent, very simply described, is a Python project and it is a simple agent powered by LLMs to perform tasks. The goal of this project is multifold. Uh, one of the folds is experimentation and benchmarking. The next is understanding and learning myself. And then another one that I that isn't explicitly listed here is that I want this to be a template repository for you or anybody else to be able to clone or fork and then make their own changes to easily, simply, and then have an agent that is specialized towards their use case themselves. So that's sort of the goal of what I'm doing here. Um, now, with that said, Simple Agent is still a work in progress. There will likely be bugs and missing features, and if you encounter them, please leave an issue in the GitHub repository. This is at Aiden Tilner slash simple dash agent. So go ahead and leave an issue if you find one. But without further ado, I'd like to just go into a very simple demonstration of Simple Agent in action. Now, here I have a simple instructions file that says create a new JavaScript script, which is capable of outputting the Fibonacci sequence to the nth term, depending on the dash n flag. Then test that the script works. Compile a report once you've finished in the form of a readme file. So I'm going to start the script with the simple agent.py command, which I have in my path. And then I'm going to just ask it, please read the instructions.md file and follow the instructions to complete the task. Once I do that, it's going to say Simi is thinking. And then it is going to read the file. Now you can see that it's created a task. It says create a JavaScript script to output the Fibonacci sequence to the nth term based on the dash n flag. Now it's writing the file, it's executing a command presumably to test it, it's modifying the task requirements, and then it is writing the file again, marking the task complete, and prompting me. So what exactly did it do here? If we check the Fibonacci.js file that it created, it created a function, uh, the Fibonacci function. We will presume that this is correct. We will be able to test this actually. So now if I do, um, this isn't the right place. If I run um, the Fibonacci.js file with the dash n flag, I have to do it like that. Um, we're just going to do it with node. If I run it with the dash n uh, flag, then it will output the terms to the 10th term. And so it actually does work, which is pretty cool. And it just kind of shows how the agent actually goes through things. It has the ability to create tasks, but it also has the ability to call tools and use tools to interact with the environment. So with that said, we gave it its instructions, it created the file, and then it created a report. It says this script generates the Fibonacci sequence up to the nth term specified by the dash n flag. To run this script, use the following command, and then that's the command that actually worked. Uh, running the command, it gives an example, and you can see that the example is correct. And then as far as the testing went, it says that the script has successfully been tested with the dash n flag to confirm it outputs the correct Fibonacci sequence up to the desired term. So everything seems to be working here, which is great. Now I want to go through and describe how we can actually go about setting this up for yourself. I'm just going to go over to a fresh directory here. I'm going to go into testing. And now... If I go to simple agent, you can see that there are multiple different options. You can clone this, and I will note that there are explicit instructions here on how to actually get set up if you just want to check out the readme. What we're going to actually be doing is creating a fork, and the reason why I'm going to be creating a fork is because this is the best way to be able to receive synchronous updates from 
the main simple agent repository. Simple agent is going to be designed as a core. So the goal is to be able to copy the repository and then modify it towards your needs. But the core should stay relatively robust and the same. And it will receive updates over time in order to improve performance. And so you would want to be able to synchronize your fork of the repository in order to receive those updates. So that's the idea of creating a fork. I'm going to be going over to my Quasar Brains organization where I just kind of put any project uh, that doesn't necessarily fit in personal. And I am just going to create a fork called Clementine. If I go ahead and create that fork, now you can see it's going to only take a few seconds or so it says. Now that we have the fork, I am going to clone it by going up here, copy uh, to code, copying this, and then going back to the terminal and running git clone, and then the URL that I just copied. Now that I've done that, I can go into Clementine with the change directory or cd command, and then I can use my editor and instruct it to open up the file. If you're using something like VS Code, then you'll want to use code dot instead, but I would recommend Z because it is a great editor. I like VS Code too, for the record. Let's open up that. Now you can see that I've got the repository here, and it's cloned. Now, there are different setup steps that we are going to follow. We already did the part where we change our directory into the directory that we are actually developing the project in. However, there is another step here which I do believe to be important, and that is to create a Python virtual environment. The reason why this is important is because then you can have an environment which is not necessarily dependent on the rest of your machine. And so you have a nice little isolated environment with the kinds of dependencies and tooling that you would like for this project specifically. So the way that we do that is with a Python command. Now, make sure that you do have Python installed. I have Python 3.10 installed, so I can guarantee that this project does work with Python 3.10. I would recommend having Python 3.10 it's got a lot of cool features in it, and it is the latest, uh, one of the latest versions. So have something like 3.10 or above, preferably, because I know that it works, and I've been able to test this with that. Uh, if you don't have 3.10 or you don't have Python installed, I would recommend looking up how to install it and going through that process. Anyway, so we're going to create a Python virtual environment to get started. You can see right here that it is as simple as Python -m vnv and then the name of our virtual environment which we're just going to call vnv so python dash m vnv vnv now you can see that it created a little vnv directory here the way that we actually utilize the environment is by using it and i i should also mention that i am specifically on mac os here but you maybe on something like Windows or Linux. So far, the process would have been relatively the same. However, at this point, instead of using source, uh, you might want to use a different command for Windows specifically. If you look inside of the virtual environment, it has a bin directory, and then it has a bunch of different scripts that you can run. And the important scripts are the activate script and the activate.ps1 script. If you're, if you're on Windows, you'll want to use the activate.ps1, but since I'm on Mac OS, I'm just going to be using the activate. So I'm going to source venv bin and then activate. Now you can see I have this little flag here in my terminal that says I am in a virtual environment. So now that I've done that, the next step is to install the dependencies. The dependencies are all listed in requirements.txt. And this is another benefit of having a virtual environment is that all of these dependencies can be accessed with pip freeze. Right now, if I do pip freeze, it's not going to tell me anything because I don't have any dependencies. However, if I run pip install r requirements.txt, 
then this is going to read all of the libraries from the requirements.txt and then load them into pip. So let me do that, pip install. It's going to run all those different scripts. All right, now that that's done, we can get into actually playing around with the engine. Well, not quite. First, we have to go over to the .env.example file, and we're going to have to copy this into a .env file. Now, the .env file is going to store all of these different variables that will be loaded into the project or your specific instance. So this is on a per instance basis. We can do this very rudimentarily by just copying this file and then pasting it. Now, all we need to do is change the name of it to .env. You can see that it's grayed out. Assumedly, your editor of choice is going to be able to do that feature as well, but essentially that is saying that the git ignore file is blurring that out. It is not being included in git version control. That's because this file contains secrets that you do not want in your version control. So what do we put in here? You can see if we just go through this file that there are a few different areas where we need to fill in the blanks. For example, right here in the log directory variable, we're going to want to put whatever directory that we actually want our logs to show up in. You can access your current directory with pwd, I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to instruct the logs to show up in the storage directory. So I'm going to make sure that the, that directory exists, and then there we go. Um, the next one is the model choice. Now currently both OpenAI and Anthropic models are actually available. I'm going to be using OpenAI here. Because I'm using OpenAI, I'm going to need to fill in these blanks here, OpenAI API key and OpenAI model. For OpenAI model, I'm just going to select GPT for O mini because that's the simplest. Now, if you don't have an OpenAI API key, the way to get that is by going to platform.openai.com and then going to dashboard, API keys, and here I'm going to create a new API key, which is going to be called simple agent demo. Now you can create that secret key, copy it, and head back to your .env file where you'll paste that in. As simple as that. OpenAI API key has to have your API key in it. Now, this is theoretically everything that we actually need in order to get started here. I will add that there are other options in here. These are not necessary with the default. If you choose Anthropic instead of OpenAI, then you will of course want to fill in the, open a the Anthropic API key and Anthropic model keys. However, the vector storage and the simple vector store stuff, that will be in another tutorial. Now, I will actually mention that because over here in tutorials, under the simple agent repository in the tutorials directory, you can find addingmemory.md where after you've got this all set up, you can actually set up Simple Agent to interact with a rudimentary vector store in order to store memories. And you can find all the information about that here. Anyway, so now that we've actually got this working, theoretically, we should be able to run the agent. So I'm going to run python simpleagent.py, and it might throw an error, but it might not. Okay, so it's going to say, hello and welcome, my name is Simi. Simi. Now, I don't actually want it to be named Simi. I want it to be named Clementine. So how do I do that? Well, if we go over to the simpleagent.py, which is the root file in the entire project, then you're going to find a CLI. The CLI starts, oops, the CLI starts up here. And essentially, this is all startup stuff but there are various different arguments that the CLI provides. 
um, like clear logs or silence actions, which just clean everything up a little bit. But if we go all the way up here, you can see that we have a system prompt. This system prompt is loaded into the agent and essentially instructs the agent on its identity. The simple prompt comes from systemprompt.md, which we can find here also in the root of our directory, right under simple agent. This entire file is completely editable by you, and any time that you want to change something, you can come in here and you can change it. You can wipe this entire thing and change it entirely. The first thing that I want to do here is, instead of saying you are simi, it's going to say you are clementine. A helpful agent capable of performing tasks through interaction with and instruction by a user. Now, before going and changing all of this, I would recommend changing, or I would recommend understanding what it's actually doing here. A lot of this is simply clarification on how the system works so that the agent doesn't get confused. This is all designed to coerce the agent in a certain direction, and I've managed to fine tune it in a way where it doesn't get confused very often, doesn't go into infinite loops, doesn't do things like that, which ultimately harm uh, harm performance. So tread carefully, but by all means, come in here, play around, and have a good time modifying this system prompt. Tell me how it works, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Back over to the simple agent.py script. Now, we changed the name in the system prompt. However, if we search simi, then it is actually available in a couple of other places. And that's because Simi is the default name. Now in the future, I might make this a little bit easier to change, but for now we can just do a code highlight with something like control F and that will allow you to search for instances of a given word. And then we can just replace those in place because they're all strings and it doesn't really matter that much. Clementine. So now that I've gone through and just changed all of the instances that I found of Simi. One more spot. It will actually appear to say Clementine instead. Now I finished all of the ones in simple agent. Let's go over to agent.py and there is one more. Now it says Clementine everywhere. If you do control shift F, you should be able to do a full text search of the entire repository. I don't see a single instance of Simi, so we have successfully changed its name. Now, if I run Python simple agent.py, it will say Clementine. Hello and welcome, my name is Clementine. Hello. We're just gonna say hello and see what it does. That's gonna say send message to user. Now, this is one of the areas of confusion that I was previously talking about. I want to keep in mind that for this particular demonstration, we are using GPT-40 Mini, which doesn't have the same performance as 4.0. I'm actually going to change that because I would like you to be able to see how you're probably going to want to run it. GPT-40 simply has better reasoning capabilities. So the thing that I was going to say is that there are two different tools that the agent has in order to interact with the user. One is send message to user and one is prompt user. Send message to user does not block. It does not actually prompt the user for input, whereas prompt user does. And sometimes I have seen the agent get confused between the two of them. It will repeatedly send messages because it never stops the program if it sends a message and it will not prompt the user. So that's an area where that's going to require experimentation and iteration, which is what this project is well suited for. However, you can see that this is actually up and running and it is capable of utilizing its tools. So if you've followed the steps so far, and if you got confused along the way at any point, feel free to either submit a issue or just clarify a little bit within the repository itself where there are more explicit instructions on how everything works. With that said, now I'd like to get into how Simple Agent actually works. Now, if I come over here to Excaladraw, 
I have a little diagram here which has an overview of the agent. The way that the agent works is perception focused. I don't really have a good name for this kind of agent, uh, maybe a perception based agent or a perception thought reasoning agent. I don't know yet. But essentially, it has a perception. It is capable of perceiving the environment, and everything is centered around that perception. Now, I do want to take a second to note that I am actually working on an agents from scratch course. So, while it's not going to be available when this video is published, it will be available at some point, and I would strongly recommend checking out the description. It may be there um, once I do have the agents from scratch course published it will be in the description of this video however for now it is not with that said the agents from scratch course will go over these concepts in much greater detail as well as building something like simple agent entirely from scratch so if you're looking for something much more in depth then follow that i will also mention real quick that i actually do have a sub stack where i also go in depth about agents in my all about agents series so check out software and synapses on Substack and my other Substack as well, bite-sized for additional content and agent-specific posts that go into depth on a lot of these concepts such as testing, evaluation, and memory. Anyway, if we go back to Excaladraw, essentially everything is perception-based and perception is made up of a combination of memory, agency, and environment. Now, by default, Simple Agent doesn't really have memory. I do actually have a way to add memory to it, like I mentioned before, so you can check out that tutorial over here in the repository in the tutorials slash adding memory.md file. However, for our purposes, it doesn't really need memory. It's capable of performing tasks on a thread by thread basis, and it doesn't necessarily need persistent memory between each thread in order to do that. For reference, a thread is what I created here. Now that I have exited out of it, I have ended the thread. It will not remember our conversation after I exit out of it. With memory, it could remember aspects of it if it chooses. However, for now, it won't remember past the individual thread. So once you hit control C or command C, it's not going to remember it anymore. That's fine. For our purposes, it's capable of performing a lot of tasks. However, essentially memory, agency, and environment come together in order to build a perception, which is then fed to a reasoning engine, like a large language model, like GPT-40. And then actions are performed, which impact the environment and the loop repeats. So this is how the agent is designed, and Simple Agent itself was designed to test this concept of a memory agency and environment-based perception and then thought loop. So that is essentially how it works. With that said, I'd like to take a second and go even more in depth and show you a bit of the code, as well as some advanced usage that you might get out of it. If you're not interested in that kind of thing, you might be able to end the video here and you would be completely fine because Simple Agent is now working on your computer and you can just go and go in, poke around, and have fun, test it out, and more importantly, give me feedback on it so that I can fix it because I'm sure you will uncover all sorts of bugs. Leave an issue. I would be very happy to address it. Anyway, so this is the entry point to our program. I'm going to clean up some of my files here. The entry point to our program is right here, if name equals main. What it's doing here is it is essentially saying, if this is the main entry point of the program, then execute these instructions. You probably already knew that. The important thing comes down here, where we initialize the agent, and then we say agent.start. So, this agent class is the center to everything, and we are starting it up here. Now, there are a couple of other classes of interest. However, we're just going to start with the agent, and we'll get to the pub sub, which 
doesn't matter as much, but does kind of play a significant role within the infrastructure of the project. But the LLM and the toolbox and the vector store are much more interesting. So the agent. The agent is initialized, and the thing we're really looking at here is the run function, because the run method here is essentially saying if we are running, and we're only not running if the stop signal is sent, then we are going to first synchronize our messages with the memory. That doesn't really matter, but we are going to check the waking state, and then we are going to first reason about the current state of the system, then we are going to act, and then we are going to do it all over again. It's this constant reason, action, and then feedback loop that happens. So the most important thing here is check waking state. Check waking state first checks, does the agent have incomplete tasks? If it does, then it should be awake. If it doesn't, then we can set self.awake to false. However, if the environment has new stimuli recorded, then we also should be awake. New stimuli in the environment is understood as whether or not it has unseen messages or new tool messages. So this essentially means that if you send the agent a message, then it is going to perceive that as new stimuli, meaning it has something to respond to. The way that the agent works is it works on a constant loop. It doesn't do it based on whether or not you have sent it a message. It's not a chatbot. It is an agent. It is an actual entity that has a constant loop. It's constantly paying attention to its environment and trying to figure out whether or not it should respond to something. So with that said, when you do send it a message, you aren't necessarily triggering the agent to immediately respond because you call a function. Rather, you are populating the environment of the agent, and then that new stimuli is picked up in the next cycle of the loop and then responded to. So it works out, but I just think that that is an important clarification because the agent runs on a constant loop. It is constantly looking around and perceiving it. It's, its environment. It's a bit of a waste of resources for it to constantly be sending those uh, asking an API to reason about its environment or trying to perform actions when it doesn't need to be, but that new stimuli is how we actually check that. So if it has incomplete tasks, then it should be awake. And if it has new stimuli, meaning that somebody texted it, or it has a new tool message, meaning it just performed a function, then that is another reason why it might have a new stimuli and it should be awake. With that said, now that we've clarified what check waking state does, that's just a check to make sure that we aren't running all of this stuff when we don't need to be, when there is new stimuli and when the agent should be awake, then we are going to start by reasoning and then we are going to act. So what does self.reason do? Reason first evaluates the memory. By default, this evaluates to nothing. There is no memory actually included, but if you do go through the path of adding memory to the agent, then this will be populated. But then we go into building the prompt. The prompt is a combination, as we mentioned before, of perception, memory, and agency. Perception is the perception of the environment. For you as an agent, perception is the screen that you're looking at and then all of the other things which come into that. Now, this might be a little bit deceiving because it says perception here, but really the prompt itself that is being built is the perception. Perception is also influenced by memory and agency. So I do think that it was a bit of a mistake to name this variable this way. It's not necessarily perception, it is environment. And so that might be worth updating in the future. So that's better clarified down here. The perception, which we can think of as this prompt right here, is a combination of environment, memory, and agency. So this prompt down here, which we can think of as our perception, is a combination of environment, memory, and agency. Now environment, in this case, would be our sense of the environment itself. Uh, that is the 
various stimuli from the environment which flood your senses and your bubble up your brain. As they bubble up, they're also greeted by memories and weighed in by memories. When you look at a tree, a lot of your memory is influenced uh, is influencing your perception of that tree. You don't have to do as much thinking. There's a lot of stuff automated. So your consciousness doesn't focus as much on understanding the new stimuli because it's not actually new in your memory already can do that processing mechanistically rather than consciously. And then agency is thought of as your goal in a certain direction or your aim at a certain direction. So agency in our case we get from this get agency method, which returns all the incomplete tasks that the agent currently has. So that's essentially how that works. Now, if we do want to dive a little bit deeper into each of these modules specifically, we'll get into those in that aforementioned course, but essentially agency has and manages tasks. So Tasks look like this. They have a description, they have a list of requirements, they have whether they're completed or not, and they have a notes field. The agent is capable of creating tasks of a given description, changing the requirements, marking them complete, and keeping notes as it goes along as a sort of working memory. Notes are available to agents by default, so you don't have to worry about going through that memory process in order to add notes. Notes are already there, the agent is perfectly capable of keeping notes as it goes along. So, with that said, that is how the prompt is actually built. If we go back up to Reason, Reason gets that prompt, it creates a message, and then it goes in and it appends that message to the messages array, and then we get a response from the language model. Now, this LLM class is actually of particular importance because this is how you can get the simple agent to work with any model that you might be interested in. This LLM class is specially designed to be polymorphic and flexible so that you can take any language model that you are interested in using in simple agent and simply adapt it to this interface. Examples include the OpenAI and Anthropic models. And it's more important here that you have a per interface implementation and integration rather than a per model integration. For example, OpenAI isn't a model, OpenAI is a company. However, the way of interfacing with each of their language models, with each of their chat models specifically, is essentially the same. And so all that you have to do is have something like an environment variable, like the model choice variable, that lets you choose at any point between any different model that's actually available in your instance. And then all you have to do is use something like the OpenAI uh, and OpenAI API key variables here to actually configure that instance on a per model basis. So essentially, that's how you would go about more advanced usage. You can take a look at the OpenAI and Anthropic examples to get an idea of how you can actually go about this. But essentially, what it comes down to is providing the LLM class with four different attributes. First, you give it a name. Then you give it a model name, which is what we're doing right here. This is getting loaded into this. And then you give it a get model response function and you give it an on startup function. So those are the four things that you actually have to provide to the LLM class at this moment. Then once you have actually created this instance, you can go back over to a simple agent and you can load it into the LLM choice map. Say you wanted to add Llama in here, you would simply create your Llama version of this. So you do like Llama LLM, and then it'd be an LLM with all of these different attributes added to it. And then you go back to a simple agent, you add Llama in here, and then you do 
llama lolm like so obviously i didn't actually do that so it's throwing an error but that's what you would do and then over here in the env file you would switch model choice to llama and you can do that with any model that you can adapt to this interface. As long as you can make a get model response function that looks like this, takes a list of messages, takes a list of tools, and takes a system prompt, then you can make this work. Now, with that said, the agent class is pretty important. I mentioned the pub sub earlier. If you're actually working in simple agent, then you might find this useful to understand, but Frankly, it is a very simple pub subclass. You can create publish publications and subscriptions. So you can either subscribe to an event or you can unsubscribe to an event. And then whenever that event is published to, your instance will get notifications for that. So if I go back into simple agent, you can see that I have various subscriptions. When the agent lo underscore log event is fired, for example, it's going to run the agent log function with log as a parameter. So that's what the pub sub does. Not super interesting, but it is important. Now the toolbox is an area where it is actually a little bit more important because this is where you're going to want to go if you ever want to add tools to the agent. These are the default tools and this is kind of what you're interested in. Now, I will mention that this is actually where that is coming in. These are the tools. Wherever you put in here is going to be the tools that are loaded into Simple Agent. So for example, what I just did is I just made this a dictionary of these three particular tools. This is how you actually go about adding the different tools that you want into the agent. Just make sure that send message to user in this case, this key on the left corresponds to the name instantiated in the tool. This needs to match with this. That's the important thing. I'll get into a second, an example of configuring a tool specifically, but that is what is important. That send message to user in this case corresponds to send message to user in here because these are the names that will actually be given to the model to choose between and then this dictionary mapping over to a specific tool is how it will be decided so yeah just keep that in mind as you're adding tools right now these are the default tools so this map here is where you're going to find all of the different tools that are by default given to the agent in order to use it can run javascript it can make web requests Sometimes that doesn't work. It might not for you. I hope it does. It can edit files. That's a little bit finicky too. It can execute commands. Be careful with that one. It can write files. It can read files. It can prompt the user. We went over this before. Or it can send message to, messages to the user. If it sends a message to you, it isn't going to prompt you for feedback. But if it prompts you, then it will prompt you for feedback. It's the difference between those. Now, as for adding tools specifically, you can see that over here on the left, they're all just different files. But when they're actually added, the way to instantiate a tool is by declaring a tool class. This is another thing that I'm trying to do a lot of, and you might have seen this pattern in Simple Agent, is make these classes very adaptable. That way, there's a lot of flexibility to use different models but also a common interface that everything eventually boils down to, which is relatively simple that you can use to define things and then use them across various models. So everything, every tool, for example, corresponds to this tool class. A tool needs a name, it needs a description, it needs the function to actually call, which will take a pub sub and an any, an any type argument and then it will take a list of parameters. Parameters is a dictionary with a string as a key and then anything on the other side. So send message to user is an example of a tool where send message to user is the name. This is actually what is called by the LLM. So this needs to correspond with this map over here. 
we give it a description. This is a prompt. That's important to remember about the description, is that it is actually a prompt. This is how the LLM, this is how the language model is actually going to decide to use this in the first place. It's going to use it based on the description. So keep that in mind. The function, the LLM never sees. However, this is going to actually be how this particular function is called by the LLM. So the parameters are what it does actually see. And this is also important. You need to make these parameters in a JSON schema format. These just correspond to the OpenAI and anthropic um, ways of doing things. And so that's essentially what you need to send it. There might be other things, other types of models that do not take a parameter like this, but that is the job of the LLM adapter class because you can, as long as you can adapt everything, you should be fine. But this is how you define a tool. You define a tool by first defining the tool itself and then going over here and creating a function which takes these two things as arguments. This can be anything, technically. We don't, this is just an unknown. It is going to have to be any, so I would recommend handling edge cases in each of these arguments, uh, in each of these functions, so that you don't run into unnecessary errors. And then, with tools, whatever is in, whatever is returned by a tool, in this case, it's a string. For example, if there aren't any arguments, then it's actually going to say error running the tool no message provided. This is something that the LLM is going to see, so it's able to correct. So return a string from your function, that is what the LLM is going to see. All of the execution of the function is handled before the return statements, obviously. So for example here, ps.publish, new agent message, and then it is going to take the content and add that to the event. So this is a use case for the pub sub. It, you could do things like this, which allow for uh, sort of asynchronous execution. Because if I go over here, down here, this new agent message actually does print the message, and then it writes it to a file in a thread. So these are subscriptions which are part of the main thread up here and actually lead to execution in the main thread which is why they're useful and why it's useful to have a pub sub passed to each of these functions so that you can use it too. And so, yeah, that is essentially what's going on here is we have a function which returns a string after performing some sort of function. This can do whatever you want. So this is essentially where you will add any of the functionality that you'd like. You can do it over here in toolbox and this toolbox class, which, that, yeah, this toolbox class will actually be given to a individual LLM to perform reasoning on. With that said, other than some other details that I'm sure we could go over, that is everything about Simple Agent that I think is going to be immediately important to you. If you have anything in particular that's very important that you would like to ask about, do so in a comment below or check out the GitHub repository and leave an issue there. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions. I'm looking to, for a ton of feedback. If you feel like contributing, that's cool too, but no expectation there. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on the project. I would love to hear how you get it set up. I would love to hear if it's helpful to you at all. And if there are any bugs, I would love to fix those. So. Again, I would like to mention that I am going to be a, doing a tutorial series. It's not out yet, but once it is, it will be in the description below, and you can check it out if you're interested in learning how to build something like this entirely from scratch. It won't be as complex as the Simple Agent project because this project is entering some form of early maturity. However, it is going to be a functional prototype type project that you will have built on your own from the ground up, understanding a bunch of key concepts in order to actually build agents from scratch. Then I would like to just do a quick shout out again of my Substacks. This is Software and Synapses. It's a publication where we sort of dive into software and 
philosophy and its intersections with psychology and design and engineering. And so there are new essays every two weeks and a specially curated archive and library of essays that I have written on various subjects. So if that sounds interesting to you, do check it out. My other publication on Substack is called Bite Sized, where every week we do short and sweet breakdowns of industry trends and news, which just cover anything from the WordPress situation to the Internet Archive to OpenAI's new models. Go ahead and check that out as well. Both of those are on Substack, and you can find me on Substack at Aiden Tilner. With that said, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you next time. Goodbye.